Hello, and it's very good to be with you. Thanks for having me. We are in interesting and challenging times for maritime welfare. The COVID crisis and now the conflict in Ukraine have imposed unparalleled challenges on seafarers and on their families. Stress and distress are impacting on mental health. I pay tribute to so many across the industry who've recognised the urgency of this and supported a wide range of responses aimed at supporting seafarer well-being. However, although seafarer welfare has risen high up so many agendas, severe restrictions on shore leave and on full ship access continue to limit the ways in which support can be offered. The Mission to Seafarers, like colleague organisations, continues to deliver high levels of service expressed most particularly at present in gangway visitation, personal shopping, support with communication and emergency response. However, much of our normal operation is unable to function properly. We're in, in an in-between period. We've left behind the old normal, we're working in radically different circumstances, and we're unclear about the new world that lies ahead. What might the future of seafarers' welfare look like? The Mission to Seafarers is a leading global deliverer of maritime welfare. Our work began back in 1856, and in the 166 years since, huge changes in the shipping industry have necessarily impacted on the way in which we've had to work. Technical advances in communication now combine with other shipping industry realities to impose a new revolution. Our core work and the focus of all maritime welfare has always been our face-to-face -face physical presence with seafarers and the related practical support, hospitality centres for example. However, changing times even before the pandemic, smaller crews, quicker turnaround times, increased technology options, were already forcing the recognition that more of our work needed to be done digitally. And that reality has been dramatically enhanced by the events of the pandemic. Communication has always been a core need of seafarers, one with which we've been closely associated. Once the writing and posting of letters in our shoreside centres, then telephoning, provision of computers, and later SIM cards for crews now ubiquitous mobile phones. And during the pandemic, the provision of MiFi units to ships, to those ships without Wi-Fi. We cannot overstate the vital need for seafarers, backed by the Maritime and Labour Convention, of having free, good quality access to strong, onboard Wi-Fi. At present, with shore leave so radically restricted, and now with the impact on so many of war in Ukraine, that is even more important. Such provision has markedly improved during this last two years, as reflected in our Seafarer Happiness Index reports. Incidentally, itself one of our digital contributions and an important benchmark of seafarer well-being. The graph is upward, but issues remain. Statistics vary, and I hesitate to give them in a fast-changing environment, but one report suggests 80% of seafarers may have some onboard Wi-Fi, with perhaps 60% of that being free. However, quality, together with generosity and frequency of access, varies wildly. We join with so many others across shipping in urging further work in the provision of universal, free, generous and high quality digital access across shipping. In the modern world, this is a basic human right. There is no room for paternalistic argument around the potentially disruptive aspects of digital access on board. Well, there can indeed be problems, and we all know that social media has potential downsides. These are issues to be managed, not avoided by eliminating access. Through the Happiness Index, seafarers have repeatedly spoken of having their online access increased with leaps in the time they were allocated. They also express their gratitude for campaigns to deliver free access to calls or free internet access across the holiday period. And I'm sure that in the next survey, many will express thanks for the additional free capacity offered during the Ukraine crisis. There has been much progress and that must be acknowledged. That said, there's still a very clear divide between vessels that provided free or cost-effective access versus those that did not. In some vessels, access is scandalously expensive. One seafarer told us our internet on board cost 25 US dollars for 100 megabytes. 
and there are huge issues over quality. One respondent commented, the International Space Station can have video calls with Earth, yet we get a crackly and intermittent voice call at best. There's going to be a clear knock-on impact on employment issues as seafarers demand the best in internet access, especially following the experience of the pandemic. Again, I quote, today internet on board is vital. Nobody will stay on board with poor, expensive or ineffective network systems. The online lifeline for many seafarers on board makes for happier crews. Being able to look forward to speaking with home was the motivation throughout their working day. Again, I quote, knowing I can go online after my shift makes such a difference. Another person talked about it as being a stress buster, as talking with family makes me feel better every time. We fully support the current renewed drive for high quality, free and generous access. And we're thankful for those who are increasingly making this possible. I now look briefly at some of the specifics in terms of digital approaches to welfare. Of course, helplines of various kinds, most notably Seafarer Help provided by Ice One, have been around for some time and continue to offer an extensive, vital and professional service. During the pandemic, we've seen the emergence of further helpline support, often at a company level and sometimes providing access to online counselling support. This is an excellent trend, although statistics warn us that many seafarers remain reluctant to take up such help. However, I believe perceptions are shifting all the time as mental health is much more openly spoken of. But views tend to be culturally conditioned and different cultural approaches are critical in all these matters. At the Mission to Seafarers, we launched our own new digital service early in the pandemic. Chat to a Chaplain was staffed by 25 of our chaplains and available 24 hours a day. We were able to respond to questions, concerns, cries for help or simply requests for a prayer. We hope it played some part in the plethora of solutions offered during COVID and it continues. Beyond that, our local teams are increasingly involved in sustaining relationships with seafarers they've met via social, through social media, where once a single brief encounter with a seafarer was a one-off event, now a relationship can be electronically sustained and issues or concerns followed up. Also, new digital reporting systems within strict confidentiality rules also help enable continuity of care as a seafarer moves from one port to another. We Care is another digital departure for us, a suite of training programmes designed to address crew well-being. The object is to safeguard seafarers by addressing three important topics, money, communication and relationships. By addressing the root causes and triggers of poor mental health, we can help provide support for seafarers. These are all now available in digital form and are offered to companies and individuals in support of better resilience and personal growth. Training plays a critical role in ensuring safe and efficient operations on board ships. And as the industry changes and the development of new technologies in the marine field increases, we must ensure seafarers have access to training both onshore and while at sea. That is essential for career progression as well as for safety. Well-being and personal resilience training, as we've learnt in these last months, are an absolutely essential part of that. We believe that the future of maritime welfare lies in a hybrid approach. Digital will play a huge role. Technology is making that possible. Changes within the industry make it a necessity. Through the pandemic, we've been starkly reminded of the fragilities we face as an industry, the consequences of which are being chiefly experienced by those at the front line, seafarers and their families. The way in which seafarer well-being has climbed to the top of almost every agenda in our industry has been deeply heartening. The efforts of many companies, organisations and individuals in doing remarkable things to support seafarer well-being has often been inspiring. We've all seen the need not just to be reactive in response to the stresses and issues facing crew, but to be proactive in preparing, in training, in building resilience. Seafarers need to be better able to look after themselves to nurture their own mental health. Vitally too, they need the tools to be able to look after each other, to recognise the signs of personal crisis and be able to respond. After the last two years, it's easy to make seafarer life sound grim. It's often been so in these last months. However, it remains a life full of opportunity and fulfilment. 
I have begun meeting seafarers again in the last few weeks as I've started to visit ports. Last weekend, I stayed in a hotel packed with seafarers. I've encountered amidst all the difficulties, much enthusiasm, cheerfulness and hope. Digital responses, such as those I've outlined above, can play a great role in building confidence in the face of adversity. Enabling seafarers to set sail and progress in their careers and assuring families that loved ones are getting vital support. But in my final note, I want to underline very strongly that digital is not the sole panacea for future welfare. Though it has a vital part to play, it remains our absolute conviction that face-to-face -face encounters cannot be replicated online. Traditional maritime in-port welfare solutions will remain important long into the future. Seafarer wellbeing demands that these are able to recommence as soon as possible. While everyone understands the dilemmas and the need for safe operation, ship visitors need fuller access to ships. Seafarers need hospitality centres and local communities. They need a break from their shipboard environments. And it's my plea that in all the talk of digital and for all its importance, these realities will not be forgotten. I hope we can all work together to find ways of building confidence and creating together an environment in which seafarers can truly flourish and live the lives of fulfilment and adventure to which everyone aspires. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your attention. Next, we'll screen a video from the International Chamber of Shipping. Let us watch. This is what a seafarer looks like. This is what an electrical officer looks like. Work at sea is an amazing thing. The number of women is increasing, so the maritime sector is going to be better. The tide is definitely turning. When I started my career at sea, there were no female officers or captains. I am witnessing how the sector continually evolves as more women are contributing to this male-dominated industry. Sometimes people will underestimate my abilities in this job because I'm a woman. I answer them by performing my job effectively and efficiently. I do not answer them by words. What men can do, women can do also or can do better. Thank you. And we'll now show the WSG deck on CCP and training support.
And lastly, we'll be featuring a video from the Sea Transport ITM refresh launch video. As the world's busiest container transshipment port, biggest bunkering hub, and top international maritime center, Maritime Singapore is in a strong position, but we have to paddle hard to stay ahead. The sea transport sector is an important enabler of Singapore's global connectivity strategy. It's the forerunner for trade and economic activities in Singapore. The maritime sector is the lifeblood of global trade and a key pillar of Singapore's economy. This creates good jobs, many of which are taken by locals. Sea transport has remained resilient amidst the challenges of COVID-19, supply chain disruptions, digitalization, and decarbonization. We are turning these challenges into new growth opportunities to attract more business activities, grow the pie, and ultimately benefit Singapore and Singaporeans. The ITM would complement our strategies to grow our global hub port and international maritime centre. It will help us achieve our vision for Singapore as a global maritime hub for connectivity, innovation and talent. So it's very timely that Sea Transport ITM launched four years ago is to account for these new challenges as well as also capture new opportunities in this whole new backdrop. Over the next five years, digitalization, innovation, sustainability and talent will be key areas of focus. So by 2025, we expect to achieve the vision that we've set out to do. Our areas of focus till then would be first, to build a vibrant, innovative ecosystem to drive competitiveness and new growth areas. Second, to leverage automation and to drive the productivity transformation of the sector. Third, to develop a future-ready maritime workforce equipped with global skill sets. Fourth, to work with partners to support maritime companies to level up their potential as global champions. And finally, to ensure the relevance and resilience of maritime SG as a key node in the global supply chain. Ambitious as it might be, our strategies and targets set out from now to 2025 exemplifies the strong tripartite partnerships in achieving our vision for the sea transport sector and for Maritime Singapore to flourish. To support this goal, the Maritime Industry Transformation Tripartite Committee is established to spearhead industry transformation of the sea transport sector. The MITT embodies the close collaborations and partnerships of the government, the industry and the unions working together for the sea transport community. Always looking towards the future as we sail towards the horizon as one Maritime Singapore.